Hi, you're 11. So we're going to go through your waves and light assessment. Um, we're going to look at the multiple choice section first. So question one is a lenses question. So I'm just going to grab my ruler quickly. Okay, so an object is placed in front of a thin converging lens. The diagram shows the paths of the two rays from the top of the object. Um, so you can see the object here, you've got the two rays. Uh, an image of the object is formed on a screen to the right of the lens. How does this image compare with the object? Very few of you finished the diagram, and this caused a lot of you to trip up. So don't do things in your head, always try and complete. So this ray clearly went through the centre of the lens, so it's going to continue the way it came. We've got one coming in parallel to the principal axis, so this must have gone through the focal point, so this is F. But again, I can continue that ray. Okay, And what I'm seeing is those two rays meet at a point down here, so I'm going to extend the principal axis out. Sorry, it's not perfect there, but I'm rushing this a little bit. So you can see that the image would be drawn here and that is quite clearly enlarged so it's larger and if the object is pointing up and the image is pointing down that means it's inverted and that gives us a okay so make your life easy for yourself finish diagrams in the multiple choice bit and you will literally see the answer uh, so question two a remote controlled vehicle is traveling on the surface of a planet um, it senses an obstacle ahead. It sends a radio message. Um, so that bit is quite crucial. The fact that you know it's a radio message means that you've got something on the EM spectrum. Um, and you know that everything in the EM spectrum travels at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 metres per second. Uh, so anyway, it sends that message to a control room where it's being controlled. The control room is 2.4 times 10 to the 6 kilometres away from the vehicle. It sends a message back to the vehicle telling it to stop. What is the minimum time that elapses between the vehicle sensing the obstacle and receiving the message back from the control room? So this is a really simple um, speed distance time question. So you're going to use your speed equation and we're going to say that time is distance travelled over speed. Now the vehicle has to send the message to the control room and then the control room sends that a message back so actually the distance between the two is doubled for the distance that is traveled by the radio signal okay so this distance is two lots of 2.4 times 10 to the 6 but that's in kilometers and i need it in meters so i multiply that by 10 to the 3 to get it into meters and then I divide that by the speed, which I know is 3 times 10 to the 8 um, in metres per second because it's a radio wave. Um, and when you plug this into the calculator, you get 16 seconds, which gives you D. Question 3. We've got a sound wave is travelling outwards from a loudspeaker into the surrounding air. Here are three statements. Um, you've got the air pressure is lower at a rarefaction compared with undisturbed air. The density of the air is less at a compression compared with undisturbed air. And the distance from a compression uh, to a rarefaction equals half a wavelength. So if I draw wave front for a sound wave, very roughly, um, like this, we know that we've got a compression where the air particles are closest together and we have a rarefaction where they're furthest apart. We see another compression and then sometime later we see another rarefaction. Okay. One wavelength is the distance between two identical points on an object. Okay. So hopefully you can see that compression to rarefaction would in fact be half a wavelength which tells us that uh, statement three is correct. Um, then you are 
looking at the pressure and the density. So the air pressure is lower at a rarefaction okay, compared to undisturbed air. So rarefaction is where the air particles are further apart than normal. Okay, so there's less air particles per unit space, so there'll be less collisions. Um, so the pressure will go down because pressure is force per unit area. And with less collisions, we've got less force. So this is true. Um, and then the density of the air is less at a compression. Well, that can't be true because we've seen that a compression is where the air particles are closer together than normal. They're as close together as possible in that particular sound wave. Um, so they're actually going to be more per unit volume. So the density will be higher. So this is not right. And that gives us one and three only. Okay, question four was pretty straightforward. If you could just remember the order of speed for um, sound in different materials. So it says the sound from a loudspeaker must pass through two materials to reach a microphone. Um, so here's the loudspeaker emitting sound. It travels first through material one, then material two. Which combination of materials gives the shortest time for the sound to reach the microphone? Okay, so we know that time is distance over speed and we know that the distance traveled from the loudspeaker to the microphone stays the same so that doesn't change so in order for the time to decrease for it to get smaller the sound uh, sorry the speed must increase the speed of the sound must increase okay because it's on the denominator of the fraction we need this to go up Okay, so we then just need to look for the combination of materials that will be traveling fastest. Okay, so we know that the order okay, is going to be from fast to slow, solid, liquid, gas. Okay, think about what a sound um, wave is. Okay, it's oscillation of air particles in air, but if you're uh, transmitting sound through a solid, you're just oscillating the particles of the solid, okay? And every time there's a collision, it passes that sound wave on. And in a solid, the particles are closer together. And so those collisions happen more frequently. It will be passing that sound wave down through the solid faster. Okay, so we can see that C has two metals, okay? So we've got two solids there, whereas all of the others have liquids and gases. They will be slower. Okay, so number five then. So we've got a diagram showing white light passing through a prism. Which description of what happens as the light passes into the prism is correct? Okay, so hopefully you can see that the violet light has been refracted more. Okay, it's changed direction more than the red has. Okay, so the red light has been refracted less. So let's think about what we mean by refraction, okay? So it will refract more if it has slowed down more, okay? Refraction causes a change in direction, but that's because of a change in speed, okay? So if we think about what refraction is, it's a change in direction due to a change in speed of the light in that new medium, okay? So if we have had a bigger change in direction, we must have had a bigger change in speed, okay? And we know that we're slowing down inside of the more dense prism, and so the violet light, which has been refracted more, must have been slowed down more, okay? That's quite important. Um, so if this has been slowed down more, then the red light is travelling faster than the violet light inside of the prism. Okay, so we can see that I've chosen answer B. The speed of the red light is greater than the speed of the violet light. Well, that must be true um, because we can see that the red light is less refracted. So it's been slowed down by less amount. So it's travelling faster. Okay, and the red light is the least refracted. It hasn't changed direction as much as violet, so that gives us B. OK, 
Okay, question six is just one that you have to have remembered. So um, CIE expect you to memorize the order for frequency and wavelength of the different parts of the EM spectrum. So it says the diagram shows um, three types of EM radiation listed in a particular order, uh, and it's traveling in a vacuum. Okay, so you know that the speed of travel is the same for all of them. The fact that it tells you that means speed is constant and it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then it says, which quantities increase in magnitude going from left to right across the list? So we can already get rid of C and D because we know that speed isn't changing even before we look at what we've got because we're seeing that it's traveling in a vacuum. Okay. Um, so then we need to look at what we have. We've got microwaves, infrared, and x-rays. So x-rays are the most energetic. They will be the highest frequency. Okay, and then microwaves are the lowest energy with the lowest frequency. Okay, so which quantities increase going from left to right? Well, clearly the frequency has gone up. Okay, and so we choose A. Question seven. A police car with its siren sounding is stationary in heavy traffic. A pedestrian notices that although the loudness of the sound produced does not change, the pitch does. Okay, which row describes the amplitude and the frequency? So again, this is just a memory uh, question. You need to remember that the amplitude of sound tells us something about the loudness and the frequency tells us something about the pitch. Okay, so a very high amplitude sound will be very loud, a very a uh, low amplitude sound will be quiet. Okay, a very high frequency sound will be very high pitched. A very low frequency sound will be very low pitched. Um, so we are told that the loudness has not changed. Okay, so therefore the amplitude has not changed and is constant. So that tells us it's A and B. And we're told that the pitch does vary, so the frequency must vary. And that gives us answer B but you just need to remember which is linked to which one. Okay. A converging lens produces an image of an object O. The focal length is F, so you can see the focal point is marked on each one. Which uh, position of the object produces a virtual image? So you can just remember that the object needs to be closer than the focal length. To the lens in order to produce a virtual image we can you can just memorize that and that will help you but again you could if you were really struggling and you'd forgotten that you could start to sketch things okay because you've got the top of the object I can go th through the center oh that's not great let's do another one that's a bit better ignore my top line sorry about that um, and you know you could measure this focal length here so on mine, it's about 1.3. I can put one the other side to help me out. I know the focal point's here. So I can have one that's coming in parallel that goes out through the focal point. Okay, And hopefully you can see that that would help us form a virtual image. Okay, So always use diagrams to help you. But I think the best thing in this case is to remember that if your object is between the focal point and the lens, you will get a virtual image, and that'll be the quickest way to answer that question. Okay, question nine then was about reflection. So we've got a mirror, it's plain, meaning that it's perfectly um, in one line. Uh, you can see that an incident ray is coming in, it reaches this point and it reflects. So the normal line is at 90 degrees to the boundary to the mirror um, and you can measure the angle of instance here and the angle of reflection so this was just a case of you remembering that the law of refle reflection sorry is that the angle of instance equals the angle of reflection right that's super important to remember um, and then what you're told is that the student then changes this angle 
and then measures what the reflection would be there. Well, it will always be the same angle that the student chooses to uh, shine the ray of light in at. So it's just going to form a y equals x graph. So you're going to get this general shape. Whatever value of i you have, you have the same value of r. Okay, so that gives you c. Um, and then 10, monochromatic. So the mono means one. Okay, the chromatic tells you it's about the colour, but that's not a physics term, so we're going to change that to say wavelength. Okay, but if we have one wavelength of light, ooh, not a great diagram, but you get the idea, then we must also have one frequency, okay? Um, so we get a light of single frequency. Okay, so this was probably the hardest question on the paper, so... Let me just grab a few things that will be helpful for us. All right. We've got a shallow tank viewed from above. The depth of the water is different in the two parts of the tank. So we can see that we've got one depth of water up here and then a second depth on the other side of the boundary. You're told that the solid line represents a crest and the dotted line represents a trough. Okay, so the wavelength is between two crests, because crest is just another word for peak, or two troughs. Um, and this tripped a lot of people up, because you just took this to be the wavelength, but the wavelength is the distance between two identical points on a wave. Um, so you know that that is going to be at 5.2 centimetres for the wavelength. Okay, before you even get uh, into the rest of the questions. It's always nice to annotate with things that you know. So it says, as the wave passes from one side to the other, the direction of the wave fronts changes. Explain why the direction of the wave front changes in the way shown in figure 6.1. Now, this is the reason why lots of you lost the marks. You absolutely understood why wave fronts change direction when we reach a boundary between two different depths. You understand that it's to do with refraction. You understood that it was to do with um, the depth being different and shallower being slower. So it was really unfortunate that you then lost marks um, because you just weren't answering this particular question. Okay, so because it has said in the way shown in this particular diagram, you have to relate it to the diagram okay so you get one mark for referencing that the speed of the wave would change at the boundary okay so that would be one and if you mentioned that it slows down that was good too okay so you noticed that it had clearly gone in the direction that was showing slowing down so really well done if you got that um you then would get a mark for saying that this slowing down causes a change in direction but so far I haven't really referenced the diagram okay so the last bit is to say well in this particular diagram the bottom part of the wave so the bits down here reach the boundary first okay so as this progresses forward through space the bottom bit hits the boundary while the, the point on the wave front up at the top of the wave is still actually traveling in the same depth so you want to say that the bottom part of the wave slows down first because it reaches the boundary first. Okay, so that was a tricky question, but this is why you've got to be really careful about reading and annotating for yourself and looking at the command words in the question and making sure you link it to the question that is being asked. Okay, don't just always put your physics knowledge. Sometimes you've got to think a little bit more. So then let's go to the calculations. Well, let's just hide this bit so you don't get distracted. So the speed of the wave in the left-hand part of the tank is 0.39 meters per second. Using the information from figure 6.1, determine the frequency of the wave. So lots of you got this mark because you got the equation right. So frequency is wave speed divided by wavelength. You took the 0.39 meters per second that you were given. But lots of you used this value for the wavelength. And you also forgot to convert it to meters, so you put 2.6, okay? If uh, velocity is in meters per second, then the wavelength needs to be in meters. So we take our peak to trough 
distance, we multiply it by 2, gives us 5.2 centimetres. We then have to convert that into metres for it to give us the right value, and then we get a total value of 7.5 hertz. Okay, so just some little things to catch you out there. This would definitely be a kind of AA star question on the paper. This bit was also difficult. Some of you got it, and I was really, really impressed. Um, it was doable with the information that you had before the test, but it would have challenged you. This definitely would have been an A-star type question. Determine the speed of the wave in the right-hand side of the tank. So, we've got our Snell's law, N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. So that's good. Okay, but we also know that the refractive index of a medium is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by the velocity in that medium. Okay? So I can replace the n's in Snell's law with c over v, where n1, we're going to have v1, so velocity in this part, we'll say it's travelling with v1 here, and then in this section, it's travelling with v2. Okay, so I get c over v1 for n1, sine theta 1, equals c over v2, sine theta 2. Okay, now the c's are on both sides of the equation, so I can just cancel them. And what I'm going to do is rearrange the equation to get v2 by itself. Okay, so I multiply both sides by v2, so v2 comes up here. I then multiply both sides by v1, so v1 comes up here. And then I divide by sine theta 1 to get my v2 by itself. Okay, look at this take this equation and practice rearranging it if you're not sure how I've got to this statement. So v2 is v1 multiplied by sine theta 2 over sine theta 1. Okay, so that's how we're going to calculate our value. We know v1 because we're told that is 0 0.39 meters per second. But now let's have a little look at the angles. Okay, so it's a bit tricky because what we actually have are wave fronts rather than angles of incidence and angles of refraction. So that might have confused some of you, but they do give you angles that are helpful. So what I've done is I've re-sketched out this diagram here. Okay, let me just line it up so it's vaguely similar. Okay, so the black line that I've drawn is the boundary. Okay, so that's the same as always. We know that when we're measuring refraction, we need a normal line to the boundary. Okay, so my dotted green line is at 90 degrees to the boundary. Okay, you can hopefully see, ooh, if I keep it steady, that this is my wave front coming in. So this blue line here, if I pull this down, this blue line here, represents one of these wave fronts okay and the blue line after the boundary also represents this wave front here okay and i've marked on the 45 degrees and the 33 that are given in the question okay but what i have now added is the direction of the wave okay so the wave fronts are at 90 degrees to the direction of the wave so this pink line effectively represents this arrow here but i've drawn it all the way into the boundary so that it's at 90 degrees to the wave front okay now we know that the angle of incidence is between the direction of the wave and the normal okay and we know that the angle of refraction is between the direction of the wave and the normal on the other side Okay, and so we just want to look at what we have mathematically to make sure that you're happy with taking these angles. So what I've done is I've drawn a little, uh, drawn, cut out a little rec uh, right angle for you. So hopefully you can see I've got this lined up so that I've got one edge along my normal, one edge along my boundary. Okay, and that's 90 degrees between those two. So if this is 45 degrees then this must also be 45 degrees because it has to add up to 90. I'm now going to rotate this round so that you can see 
90 degrees between the wave front and the direction of the wave now is also split between this 45 that I've just measured and this angle of incidence I. So this is also 45 degrees. Okay, and we can do it down here as well. So let's have another look again. So we've got um, 90 degrees between the boundary and the normal. Okay, so we know that this whole angle is 90 degrees. So therefore, this must be, oh gosh, let's do some quick maths, 57, 60, 80, yeah, that's good. Um, okay, so we've got 57 degrees here. So now I'm going to rotate round, and you can see, oh, I've not done a very good 90 degrees. Sorry, I sketched it. These two are at 90 degrees to each other. Um, so we've got 57 degrees here. So therefore, this must be the angle that adds up to 90, which gives 33 degrees for this one as well. Okay, so the angles that you were given, although they don't look like the angle of instance and the angle of refraction, they're actually the values that you need. Okay, so remember that this one is theta 2. It's after the boundary, and this is theta 1. Okay, or I and R. So we're going to come back to our calculation. And you can see we need V1, which we've got, which is 0 0.39. We need sine theta 2, which we got to be 33 degrees. And our sine theta 1 was 45 degrees. Okay, so we can say that 0 0.39 for the V1 multiplied by sine 33 over sine 45 is equal to V2. When you plug that into a calculator, you get V2 is 0.3 meters per second, and that is your final answer. So that was a really challenging question, so really well done if you got that right, but hopefully that now helps you to see how you would do a question like this if it comes up in the exam. Okay, this one we also had a little bit of trouble with. So let's have a little look. So question 12, figure 6.1 shows an arrangement of, the gla of glass prisms inside a box. The angles of the prisms are 45 degrees, 45 degrees and 90 degrees. So hopefully you can see that that is clearly the 90 degree angle. This is 45 and this is 45. And again, it's the same but just it's been flipped. So we've got 45, 45 and 90. Um, and we've labelled that on. So, you've got the incident ray of light. Hopefully you can see, if that's coming in horizontally, then this angle is 90 degrees. Okay? It says, this is a device used to view objects that are behind a wall. The incident ray of light undergoes total internal reflection, important, in the prisms. On figure 6.1, complete the path of the ray through the device and show the ray as it emerges from the box. Okay, now you can hopefully see that the, the, the ray is coming in at the top. It very clearly needs to come out through here to enter the eye so that we can see it, right? You're, you're hoping to get that. Now, we are reaching the boundary along the normal, okay? The angle of incidence is zero degrees, okay? Because it's traveling in along the normal. So there's no change in direction. Okay, the ray of light will slow down when it enters the prism because it's a more dense medium, but it will just slow down along that same path. So what you should have done is continued that ray all the way to the far edge of the prism. Okay, when the angle of instance um, is 90 degrees to the boundary, it will just travel straight through. But now it reaches a new boundary. Okay, but this time, let's see if I can sketch it so that it looks vaguely accurate. The normal at this point of the prism is here, okay? Now, if this is a 90 degree angle here, then this must be 45, okay? We're going to have another 90, 45, 45 triangle, okay? So therefore, it will reflect with an angle of reflection of 45, okay? Now, hopefully you can see that if this is 45 and this is 45, then it adds to 90. If this is horizontal, then it's going to come down vertically. 
okay so it's going to travel down like this now I've carried it all the way through to this point because again it's entering this second prism at 90 degrees so it's traveling along the normal line it doesn't change direction just slows down okay so we've got our second normal line at 90 degrees to the boundary at this point and again hopefully you can see this is a 90 degrees this is 45 so this is 45 which means that the angle of incidence is 45 which means the angle of reflection is also 45 so it's going to come out horizontally okay. and when you draw that whoop, accurately better than I have you will hopefully see it can enter the eye so that gets you the three marks um, for the first bit then it says, show the refractive index of glass with a critical angle of 45 degrees is 1.41. Lots of you struggled with this, but it was quite straightforward. You just needed to use N is 1 over sine C. Okay, the refractive index of a, a medium is 1 divided by its critical angle. So you're just doing 1 over sine 45. Okay, and when you do that, you get approximately 1.41. Okay, so back to sound waves then. So, sorry, it's gone very dark. Let's see if I can get it to go to the light a little bit better. Here we go. I'm um, sorry, recording this while it's very dark outside. Sound waves consist of compressions and rarefactions. Explain the terms compression and rarefaction. So you're writing definitions, but it says give your explanation in terms of the spacing of molecules. That's the first bit. And the pressure. Okay, so you have to refer to both the spacing and the pressure to get the marks. Okay, so you're going to say compression is a region of a sound wave or a part of a sound wave where the air particles, and you can refer to air because it tells you that in the question, are closer together than normal. Okay, so they're higher pressure. Than normal. Okay. So normal being what the air is doing when the wave isn't there. Okay, so that's this bit. And then a rare faction, hopefully it's fairly obvious, is a region of space <laughs> or part of the sound wave. where the air particles are further apart. Than normal. And mention that it's lower pressure. Okay, so for both, I've referenced the spacing, closer together, further apart, and I've referenced the pressure, higher pressure and lower pressure. Okay. A musical instrument emits a sound with a frequency of 4.4 kilohertz. Don't forget that that means 4.4 multiplied by 1,000. Okay, so we've got 4,400 hertz. Uh, the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. Okay, so don't miss the kilobit. Calculate the wavelength of the sound. So we have the speed of a wave V is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. We're going to rearrange that and say wavelength is wave speed over the frequency. That's 340, and we're going to divide that by 4,400. And when you do that, you get a value of 0.077 meters. Okay, so if you put 0.08 meters you would get away with that that's absolutely fine um but this is your answer okay then it says the frequency of the sound emitted by the instrument is changed to 5.1 kilohertz so 5100 hertz 
and the amplitude, excuse me, feeling very sleepy over here, just suppressing a yawn, and the amplitude of the sound is increased, okay? Remember that amplitude means loudness, so the loudness is increased. Without calculation, so you don't need to do any maths, state what happens to the speed of the sound and the wavelength of the sound, okay? So, the speed of the sound is all to do with the medium that it, has tra it is traveling in. Okay, so we know that sound travels fastest in a solid um, and slowest in a gas. Well, the medium hasn't changed, okay? We're in air, it's a musical instrument. We're still in air, so the speed of the sound stays the same. Okay, now we know that wavelength is inversely proportional to the frequency, okay? so. If you think about what's happened, we've had a 4,400 kilohertz frequency increase to 5.5, uh, 5.1 kilohertz, sorry. Okay, so if the frequency has increased, we've got more waves passing a point per second, that must mean that the wavelength has decreased. Now, I didn't see really many people sketching this out for themselves, and that could be what led you to making little mistakes. Make your life easy for yourself. Sketch what you know has happened, and it's easy to visually see that the wavelength has decreased here. Okay? All right, question 14. So we've got an optic fiber. Um, it's made of glass that has a refractive index, so that's N is 1.4. No light refracts from the fibre at points P and Q. So if nothing is refracting, nothing is um, changing direction because it enters a new medium, what we've got, hopefully you can see, is total internal reflection. Loads of you just wrote internal reflection, and unfortunately, you needed to say total internal reflection. Okay, so that should have been a fairly straightforward mark. Then it says, calculate the minimum value angle I for there to be no refraction. Okay, so let's just sketch out if we've got a boundary between two media. So if we have light inside of a denser medium and it goes out into a more dense medium, here's your normal line. If we take that same normal line but we increase the angle of instance to the critical angle at that point we know we have refraction along the boundary and then if we exceed the critical angle so we've got an angle larger than the critical angle that's how we get total internal reflection okay so what we know is we need to find this value C to tell us the minimum value for there to be no refraction because anything larger than this is going to bounce straight back inside. Okay, so again, this is just using n equals 1 over sine c. Okay, so we've got 1.4 from the refractive index is equal to 1 over sine c. So we can say that sine c is equal to 1 over 1.4. Okay, so you're just going to, on your calculator, push shift and then sine, so you've got sine to the minus 1 of 1.4. Ooh. And you get an angle, sorry, so it can show up for you, of about 46 degrees. Okay? Okay, sorry, I've had to move uh, to plug my laptop in so it's a little bit darker, so hopefully the shadows aren't too annoying. We've only got a couple of questions left to do. So, state two uses for infrared radiation. Um, some of you wrote some very rogue answers for this one. It's just one that you need to memorise. Um, so, remote controls is a fairly obvious one. Okay, if you look on your remote control for your TV at home... Sorry, it's gone really out of focus. Come on. There we go. Um, you'll see a little red light. Um, some of you mentioned um, heating or cooking food. I allowed it because you do get infrared heat lamps in restaurants, but it's actually not technically on the mark scheme, but it wasn't a wrong answer. Um, so you could have had security alarms outside of house. Um, you could have referenced night vision. 
there are a couple of things that you could have come up with there. Um, cameras, sorry. So just make sure you memorise those. The next one is x-rays are used in hospitals to help treat patients. Suggest and explain three precautions for the safe use of x-rays. Um, some of you were talking about wearing gloves or pl plastic things. <laughs> That's not going to do anything for x-rays. Please don't put that, okay? So if you're going to talk about protective clothing, it needs to be a lead apron, okay? So wearing a lead shield would be fine. But yeah, don't refer to goggles, gloves, or plastic aprons. That's not going to help. Okay, so you could have said, I'm going to add a couple more, so this is actually point two. You could have said shielding other parts of the patient that don't need imaging. Okay, you could have referred to um, the distance from the source. Okay. Um, so, increasing the distance from the source. Sorry, I know the shadows are not great here. Um, limit the time that you spend with the source. And you can also limit the intensity of the source as well. Okay, so basically how strong those x-rays are. Okay. Uh, so then it says state the speed in a vacuum uh, of microwaves and x-rays. So they're both part of the EM spectrum. So they both travel at the same speed in a vacuum. So you just needed to put three times 10 to the eight meters per second for both. Okay, and then the last bit for one mark says, state a possible frequency for an ultrasound wave. So ultrasound is any sound above the range of human hearing. You should have memorized that the human range is 20 to 20,000 hertz. So long as you choose a number that's bigger than 20,000, it could literally be anything, it would technically be ultrasound. Okay, so any number that's bigger than 20,000. If you said 20,000, you had the right idea, but you won't get it, because that's technically part of the hearing range. Okay, I think this is the last question. Sorry, you can probably hear my kettle boiling in the background. So we've got figure 7.1 shows a converging lens and its principal axis. Um, you've got the focal point marked out at F for each bit. And then it says, draw two rays from the top of object O to locate the image of O. Label the image I. Okay, so you take your ruler. So we've got the most obvious one. It's going from the top of the object through the center of the lens. That's the easiest one to draw because nothing happens to it. So you literally just draw a straight line through. So that's one. Try and make it a little bit more accurate than mine. I'm doing it in a bit of a rush. Okay, and then your second one, you want to draw from the top of the object that's parallel to the principal axis. Okay, so you want this line here. And you know that that one will travel out through the focal point. So you want to draw that. And then where the two lines that you've drawn cross, that's where your image is. But you have to draw that arrow on. Okay, so we're going to have our image arrow here. And it asks you to label it with I, and lots of you forgot to do that, so you lost a mark. So there's I. Okay. Then in the next bit of the question, it asks you to choose three of the terms to describe the nature of the image produced by a converging lens that is being used as a magnifying glass. Now, I think you just rushed this at the end and assumed that you were describing the image that you just found, but you're not. You're finding it for a magnifying glass. Okay, so we know that the whole point of a magnifying glass is to make the thing bigger, so we enlarge. Okay. We also know 
that it is a virtual image, okay? You can't put a screen in between the object and the lens and still see that magnified image, okay? So just be careful because lots of us got this quite wrong, okay? But we do still see the image the same way, okay? So if you literally imagine getting a magnifying glass and looking at an object, it doesn't turn upside down just because you put the magnifying glass there so it's upright. Okay, very last question then. So we've got a prism um, and we've got red light passing through a glass prism. A ray of green light enters the prism along the same path as the ray of red light. So we know that before it reaches it, it's traveling along this same path that is already plotted. And then it says on figure 7.2, draw the path of the ray of green light as it passes through the prism and emerges into air. So hopefully you can remember that the whole point of the prism is to disperse the light into the colors of the rainbow. So if this is red, remember I taught you Richard of York gave battle in vain. Um, and we had that conversation where Reuben said he knew it, I think. Um, so we know that green is going to be somewhere down here. That's the easiest way to figure this out. Okay. In order for that to happen, it must be refracted more. Okay. But we know that it starts along the same path. It will refract more within the prism. So you're going to get one mark for drawing a ray underneath the red ray. Okay. And then another for drawing it out on the other side so that it's also underneath. Okay, because remember it's now hitting this boundary at a different angle. So it's going to be more spreading on the other side as well. So that were your two those were your two marks there.